Asalaamu Alaikum, good evening and welcome. As you know, it's just after 8.30 here in the United Kingdom. We're live from the studios of British Muslim TV here in Wakefield with this week's live edition of Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. We're broadcasting on Sky Channel 752 and across social media at the handle British Muslim TV. Wherever you are joining us around the world, a very warm welcome. Now, we want you to comment on the big stories we're covering tonight. You can call us now on 01924 231 083. You can message us on WhatsApp. The number is on your screen. Yes, let's have a look. I do that every week. Anyway, uh, if you're watching this on Facebook, welcome. You can post your comments in the chat box and we'll read some of them out on air as we get through the program. Now, in tonight's program, first we head to Birmingham to talk to the community activist Shaquille Afsar about UK politics in 2022 and Muslims. Then we head to Leicester and talk to Azhar Majuthi, a PhD student about understanding Islamic history and his latest book. And then we finish off in Melbourne, in Australia. Yes, it's morning there. We've got an exclusive interview with Adnan Chupani, the Iranian refugee who has been in detention since he was 15. And he was in the same hotel in which tennis star Novak Djokovic was held in recent days. He was released, but the refugees are still being held. It's a powerful lived experience and story, and I'm really looking forward to it. And I hope you will uh, stay tuned for the rest of the program. So we want to hear from you tonight. You can call us on 01924 231 083. You can message us on British Muslim TV across social media. Alternatively, you can send a WhatsApp message and you can do that anonymously as well. So the number is on your screen. Now, the questions we're considering tonight, what do you make of politics in the United Kingdom in 2022 after the events that we've seen in the last 24, 48 hours with the Christmas parties and allegations uh, of breaking the rules, but also senior Tories now saying they want the Prime Minister to quit, but the Prime Minister making uh, a fulsome apology in the House of Commons at uh, Prime Minister's questions. What do you make of politics in the UK in 2022? Fascinating conversation with Shaquille Afsar coming up. How can we understand Islamic history and why is it important to preserve this history? And what do you make of child refugees being held in detention for years in Australia? Fascinating discussion. Somebody being held in detention as a refugee for eight years, having to stay in a hotel room, not allowed to go out pretty much like a prison. What didn't you say? Anyway, we'll talk to Adnan Chupani uh, later on. Please share your thoughts on 01924 messages. I should finish the numbers. 01924 231083 messages on WhatsApp, on post and social media. Lots of ways to get in touch with the show. Let's move on. Let's start with our first story. Now, politics in the UK has been dominated by the pandemic and questions about the government's record and response. The ministers across Boris Johnson's government point out to the fast rollout of the vaccine and the booster campaign being a success and hope that the Omicron virus will lead to the end of the pandemic and that in the future, we learn to live with this as we do with the cold and other illnesses. Now, for Labour and its leader, Sir Keir Starmer, it is about sealing the deal with the public. Yes, you might say they're ahead in the polls, but that's because of the Conservative Party's mistakes and all the questions around breaking of the rules, alleged breaking of the rules, should I say, uh, in, in regards to Downing Street. And that is not a positive choice in Labour, is it? What do the Labour Party need to do in 2022 to be a government in waiting? In terms of British Muslims, how can we influence political parties and ensure that the voice of our community is present and involved in those decision makings? Now, Shaquille Afsai is a businessman. He's a community activist based in Birmingham, and he was most recently seen at the Batley and Spend by-election haranguing the Labour candidate, Kim Ledbetter. I'm pleased to say he's not going to be haranguing me tonight, I hope. Shaquille Afsai is live on British Muslim TV from Birmingham. Dear brother, Salaam alaikum. A very warm welcome to the programme. Welcome back. Oh, the joys of technology. Can you hear me? Check in. I can hear you loud and clear, Shafiq. First of all, tell us, what have you been up since, you, since we last had you on the programme? So, yeah, Alhamdulillah, we've been active in the city of Birmingham, as you know, with the largest Kashmir community. Um, Birmingham is active in itself when it comes to fighting for the right of self-determination alongside with the Palestinian issue. 
Um, yeah, we've been active on the ground fighting uh, the causes that we feel are most crucial to us. And it has been a hard road. I, I can't. I have to say that COVID has really put in a, a lot of a stop and standstill in many campaigns that we were running only because, as you know, uh, our community was disproportionately affected. So we kind of had to put hold to majority of the campaigns we were running in regards to the things that affected the British Muslims that exist here in Birmingham. OK, so now during the Bali by-election, you appeared on that last Friday before the campaign, you harangued the Labour candidate, Kim Leadbeater, do you regret what you did and will you apologise to Kim? Well, Mohammed Shafiq, I'd, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to apologise to absolutely nobody. Uh, the simple fact is the Labour, uh, the Labour Party in itself and uh, the a member of parliament, Kim Leadbeater, with all due respect to yourself, that we understand that they're highlighting certain issues that the conservative government are doing now, but they also need to remember that we remember, we remember that under the Tony Blair administration, how Labour Party raped the Middle East. We remember that till this day, we are feeling the repercussions. And unless there's an apology I mean, for you, that, you, or, sorry, a just, sincere, just, just, or a sincere, or a sincere, a, a yeah. sincere U-turn uh, you, from you, Labour you, Party, you, 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 you can't speaking, stand by them. You just figure speaking, use the term rape, but you mean uh, figure speaking, don't you? Um, of course, abso yeah. absolutely, as just in the fact that they started the violence, they started okay. the bloodshed that we all as British citizens witnessed in the Middle East. Now, I, I, I do believe that Labour can turn this around, but unfortunately, under the leadership of Keir Starmer, who, as a leader of a party, has done a U-turn on our Kashmiri cause, can we really support? Has he left? Has he really left us with a, a sort of card to support him? Okay. I think not. Uh, do you accept that your intervention in that by-election strengthened the Labour campaign in the final few days, and many in the Labour Party were saying was a key reason why she was able to win the seat? No, I, 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 disagree, I disagree. Coming from a constituency that Labour Party has held for 27 years, which is the whole Green constituency, unfortunately, you will see in years to come that the younger generation are being more educated to what are they voting for? What is the manifesto of this party? What is their, what is their plan for us in the future? Do they, do they seek to protect the, our innocence of our Abrahamic faith, faith children? Do they seek to protect the innocence of people in the Middle East? And, and I only say that, look, in our candidate, we, in our constituency, we have a saying that Labour Party could even put up forward a donkey and they would be elected. That is because of the systemic lack of education in okay. our community as to what a party stands for, mm. which, which we, for the last year, have been working on to educate people. If you choose to vote for Labour, which is fine, and we respect you for that, but at least understand what their manifesto stands for. Okay. And same with Conservative, because I'm neither... Just I know you know. I know. And, 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 I'm neither Conservative or Labour. Um, this is the first chance we're having this conversation. That's why I'm asking these questions. Don't you accept that Kim Ledbetter has been a strong campaigner against Islamophobia since um, her sister was murdered by far-right extremists? She supports Palestine, she supports Kashmir, has been very vocal, and in a sense your intervention tried to ignore her work and record in this area. No, I, I, I believe I have to disagree, and I, I, I completely agree with you. There's a lot of members. What, 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 of which which bit got... of that do you disagree with? That she's a campaigner no, against Islamophobia. No, no, she supported I mean, Palestine. I, I, she supports I, I, Kashmir. I, I to... What more do you want in, an, uh, MP to do? Individual members of parliament in the Labour Party, for example, we have Khalid Mahmood, we have Az, uh, Afzal for Gorton, we have Nazi Naz Shah, who's done some excellent work for the Kashmiri people. And I will never disallow that. And I've never disallowed the work, some of the work that uh, maybe even Kim Leadbeat has done. But the simple fact is this, when the party head, when the leader of the party completely does a U-turn on the Kashmir issue by stating it is a bilateral issue and not an international issue, issue it completely disallows all the good work that some of the members of parliament have done. So uh, our campaign is more in to highlight the fact that the current person who is running the Labour Party is unfortunately a Zionist and 
is not in line with what us as British Kashmiris, us as British Muslims, really want here in the UK. I mean, how do you find that experience? Let's, you know, we've got, you, you, we've got Labour now ahead in the polls. As I said at the top of the programme, that's not because people are voting for Labour. They're just voting against the government. What, what are British Muslims asking for from, from Labour? Let's talk about Labour and then we'll talk about the Tories. I think what British Muslims, I can only speak for myself. What yeah. I'm asking for is a... a See, you're government. connected. I mean, let's, let, let's just remind our viewers, you're from community, you're from Birmingham, you're connected to communities and you talk to lots of people. So that's the reason why I ask you that question. Absolutely. And I think what the British Muslims want, look, we are a peace-loving community. We have coexisted. Our forefathers came here for financial benefits due to the fact that we came from poverty. We are here to coexist with one another. But what we will not allow is misrepresentation. As long as the Labour Party can represent us on the international community and the national community on what we as British Muslims stand for, then why would we not support the Labour Party? Of course we would support the Labour Party, but when the head Pierre Strama does a U-turn on the most big issue that affects majority of the British Kashmiris, which, just to remind your viewers, the largest Kashmiri, uh, Kashmiri community outside of Kashmir exists in Birmingham, when they believe that the Kashmir issue is an international issue, for him to do a U-turn on that, he's doing a U-turn on what we believe in. He's doing a U-turn on those mothers, those brothers, those sons and daughters who have been waiting for over 72 mm. years for the right of self-determination. And, and, and you, I, I don't know, you had, will you get a perfect candidate that you absolutely align with 100%? Again, Just look, quickly, British, 10 Brit, I, I firmly believe, Shafiq, I firmly believe that British politics for British Muslims is at a pivotal stage. Okay. We have come, we have come, the simple fact is we have come from a brotherly system vote where an uh, individual of the head of the family has voted. Okay. We are now so, currently Shakir, just, in a just generation stay there. Shakir, where just, we are voting. Just stay there. I know, uh, apologise, we've got going to take a quick break. Shaquille Afsar is going to stay with us. We're going to continue this very important conversation. Take more of your calls. Join us on the other side of these very important messages. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. Live from our studios here in Wakefield in West Yorkshire. We're taking your calls now on 01924 or get in touch with us on social media. British Muslim TV is the handle. We've got an exclusive conversation with the community activist from the Midlands, Shaquille Afsa, who's my special guest joining us there from Birmingham. Now, before the break, uh, Shaquille, we were discussing the Batley and Spend by-election. Surely as uh, British Muslims, we should be able to involve ourselves in elections without it turning ugly, as it did when you arrived in town and other people arrived in town. No, no, 100% absolutely. And I think that we want to encourage the future generations that any political activity that is happening should be done in a sort of professional and a respectful mm -hmm. manner. But when a party like Labour is using the broadly system and using thugs, I, from, from the video which was went viral uh, in the millions, it's clearly evident that I'm starting a conversation peacefully, but I'm being silent in now. It, I completely, and, and every interview and any conversation that I have, I've, I've had, I've always tried to remain polite, but I will always make sure that our message is put across. And my message to the Labour Party is that they have a lot of British Muslims who are willing to support them, but right now they are at a pivotal stage where an individual, I can give you an example, Shafiq, 10 years ago, a household's information and the information of any house, household will come from the elder. It's no longer like that. The youngsters are now much more... Uh, Interesting educated, policy questions, more, aren't they? Yeah. So yeah. Labour um, Party needs to understand that broadly vote and that family vote system no longer will work because the okay. youngsters now demand facts and, you know, what is actually being done. Yeah, it just be driven by policy rather than um, loyalty in terms Absolutely. of the party uh, ticket. Let's just look at the Conservative Party. How do you assess their 2022 and, and, and what 
in terms of the Muslim agenda, do you think well, uh, impact to be, that would have? To be have? honest with you, the Conservative Party, in my understanding, has really let themselves down. And the fact that they've been partying when us guys were at home, uh, you know, refraining from celebrating Eid, and, you know, when people were in a coma, I only implore that the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, really need to possibly ask Boris Johnson to stand down because it is absolutely which, which is disgusting. What, which is what Keith Stam- disgusting. Keith Stam- would ask for today. He, he asked him for his questions for today, yeah. You know, it's I, I, you know sometimes I, I and I feel it. We, I come from a household where my my father is actually head of the family. So in my household on Eid, we would have between a hundred to a hundred and fifty people in my house, from grandmas to aunties to nephews to nieces, and it was a very very testing time celebrating Eid with just you know five six of us at home so i have to uh, completely say that it is uh, disgusting on how the, the the conservative party have behaved and moreover how they've handled the situation after by justifying that you know the the garden is you know part of their their office space etc cetera, etc cetera. I, I i i have to say that if they were doing anything they're dr- driving a bigger dent from the muslim vote than they already have and when we look at Muslims, British Muslims, in your experience, what do we need to do to amplify our voice in our politics? Not just the party politics, but politics in general. I think we just, we come from a community that's quite laid back. I think we just need to be more proactive in what's going on, following the trends that are happening, following, uh, you know, certain government information, following the Conservatives, following the... Labour Party following even the Lib Dems, just the fact of be, being active will give our community opportunities where we can push forward good candidates, whether it's in the Conservative or in the Labour, to fight for our rights and what we as British Muslims here in the United Kingdom stand for. Now, Jack Dromey, the MP for Birmingham, Erdington, who is the husband of the former deputy leader, of the Labour Party, Harry Harman died sadly on Friday. And, uh, deepest sympathies and condolences to his family, Harriet, uh, and his children and grandchildren. Um, I mean, you from Birmingham, you would have known Jack Dromey. He was a lifelong trade unionist. He was somebody committed to race equality. Yeah, abso- a- he was the um, like- he was the yeah. you know in, uh, you know the um, fight for women's rights in terms of uh, Asian women in the seventies. He was a great towering figure within the trade union movement. How do you assess yeah. his work and his contribution? Absolutely. I think, you know, there is the simple fact that I've made, even though the fact that I may disagree with certain things of Labour Party, there's no fact of when somebody is actually on the ground doing the work. And I had a, a couple of conversations with Jack informally where he is, was a very understanding person. He was a caring person who cared for his community and it is a big tragic loss uh, that Birmingham has felt. But as you know, Shafiq, uh, as we, as British Muslims, every soul shall taste death. And it was his time and it is a great tragic loss. Yeah, and he was, he was well admired, not just uh, locally amongst his constituents, but, uh, you know, as trade unionists Absolutely. have been saying. Amongst, he... our, amongst our community, I went to, before I was politically active or social media, let's say, active, I remember as a youngster seeing Jack quite active amongst that community, you know, getting involved, being part of it. And only uh, the, the pictures that we've seen on social media are only the evidence of how many of our community that he engaged with was happy to take pictures with and discuss certain issues with. So, yeah, may, may God bless his soul. And, 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 and whether I agree or disagree, a great, a great loss to Birmingham. Yeah, you can certainly... A uh, very powerful tribute there from you, Shabir. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Obviously, we're going to have a by-election at some stage. Obviously, waiting for the funeral uh, before uh, the Labour Party decide when to uh, lay the writ in Parliament so that can happen. Do you have any plans to get involved in that by-election and what sort of issues would you be advocating for? I know you are party political in that sense, but in terms of your political activities... Well, look, I will completely be involved 110% as I've always been. And I implore to Labour Party that we are only demanding a party that stands for all. You know, we, are, we don't want to be feeling like we are joining Labour Party and we are having to sell ourselves short. As long as Labour Party is the party that is 
uh, you know, for everyone and not just a few as they stay, then I'm sure going forward that, you know, we we, we have no reason the way, where there's an issue, we will speak. If there is no issue, why would we speak? Yeah, that's really important. Um, what sort of issues do you think voters will have to address in that campaign? Because obviously you talked about the Conservatives and what's been going on uh, with these parties, alleged parties, what impact that's going to have in terms of the local elections that come in May. But obviously a by-election in Birmingham, Labour versus the Tories. The Tories increased their share of the vote. Uh, Jack Dromey's share of the vote went down. What, in, what, what are some of the issues in Birmingham coming up that you think will impact I think that? I think if Labour Party concentrates on the simple fact that in Birmingham, firstly, there's a large Kashmiri community to, so to stand by the Kashmiri issue. Secondly, there is, we are a big community of Abrahamic faith people. So people who hold their religious values very close to their heart. What I would suggest is Labour should really understand to hold the Birmingham inner city votes. Majority of these people are either Christian, Jewish or Muslim. I live in Mosley, which is B13, which is predominantly Jewish slash Muslim. And if they are able to represent us in the way that we need to be represented, why would we not vote for Labour? Same with the Conservative, if they represent the Muslim people as they should be represented, which I doubt very much, but why would Muslims not vote for them? And I implore our community, rather than Labour lose our vote, try to sustain that vote, try to keep that vote and amicably, you know, keep everyone happy to make sure everyone feels represented. Now, you've been very vocal about the issue uh, of the pandemic, encouraging people to get vaccinated, to take it seriously as you were doing earlier. What do you make about the take up of the booster campaign been very low amongst Pakistanis and Bengalis and some uh, African communities in this country? Well, look, I come from, uh, I live right next to and have grown up in one of the areas which is at the highest list of uh, anti-vaxxers, which is Spark Hill. Now, I have to say that this reason for not vaccinated is directly linked to the fact of how the Conservative government behaved at the start of this COVID situation, the fact that they lost a lot of credibility by saying, go out, don't go out, stay at home, don't go home, which made our community be, feel very fearful. And the fact that our community was disproportionately affected has only reinforced the fact that people are not sure. Genuinely, people in my community are not sure whether they should take it, whether they shouldn't take it, whether they should have the vaccine, whether they shouldn't have the vaccine. And this is something that the current government really needs to think about when implementing policy that if you do not stick by it, you will scare people away from the things that you're telling them to do. Because, because the anti-vaxxer, let's be clear, uh, is propaganda, it's false news. Who do you listen to? Do you listen to the medical and scientific evidence or do you listen to some of these you know, anti-vaxxers? No, again, absolutely. I think even my community, majority of them follow the scientific advice and what the health mm. people are saying. But the fact that the way that the government behaved at the start of COVID, even I, as a young businessman who is very, very savvy, who understands what's going on, I was unsure, do I go out? Do I not go out? You know, with all what was going on at the start of COVID, which has then led to people building misconceptions. My message to everyone from Birmingham that if you're in the city of Birmingham, you must be vaccinated. We have been living here in our uh, in the city of Birmingham myself for 34 years. We believe in the NHS and we must allow those science people and the people of knowledge, you know, a bit of credibility, a bit of credibility that they've gone to all these efforts, worked, to, you know, long, long shifts to safeguard us. If we do not then follow the instruction, then we are part of the problem. Well, I, I just want to say we've reached the end of our time together. Uh, Shaquille, Afsar, thank you so much for joining us. Best wishes to you and the family. Thank you, brother. Shafiq, it's always a pleasure. Thank you thank very you, sir. much. Uh, that was uh, Shaquille, Afsar. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that point around the booster. It is proven from the science and the medical experts in the NHS that that booster protects you from getting seriously ill. And therefore... I'd encourage you all to protect yourself and your families by taking that booster. Um, and you've seen the data. Lots of people who are in hospital suffering are unvaccinated. Don't listen to an 
substantiated allegations around the safety and security of the vaccine. I'm sat in front of you. I've had a, a double vaccinated. I've had a booster. I'm still in front of you. Um, so please take that seriously. Now, what we'll do after the break, we're going to head to Leicester, great city of Leicester, for a conversation with Azar Majority. He is a PhD student. He's an author about how we understand Islamic history. How do we preserve it? How do we learn from it? It's a really important conversation. And you look at the diversity amongst our community. How do we do that? Join us on the other side of these very important messages. Don't go anywhere. I'll be waiting for you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, here on British Muslim TV. We're live from our studios here in Wakefield. And we're taking your calls on the issue that we just talked about, UK politics, but also the next topic, which is a very important conversation on 019 You can get in touch with us on our social media handle, British Muslim TV. Now, let's move on to our next, what I keep saying is a very important story. Now, when we look at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, we often turn to the seerah, we turn to the hadith to understand how he lived his life and how he was an example to us and all future generations. And in many of the communities, their history has been preserved and expanded. And it's been used as an important tool in experiencing what life was like at the time. Now, my next guest is PhD student at Nottingham University. He's studying Ahl Hadith and Salafi literature. He's, had an, he's got an MA in Islamic studies and he's just published his first illustration book about the houses of Medina at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm pleased to say Azhar Majuthi is joining us live on British Muslim TV from the great city of Leicester. Azhar, Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the program. Welcome, Salam How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? How is the family? How have you been coping during this pandemic? Alhamdulillah, everybody's fine. Thanks for asking and uh, thank you for inviting me as well. It's a pleasure. The pleasure's all mine. I mean, all the things that I've just read that you do, do you have any time to do anything like relaxing and hobbies and stuff like that? You seem to be very uh, busy. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm a graphic designer by trade. And I'm also a director at a nursery for preschoolers. So I'm trying to juggle everything at the same time. Well, you're doing a great job and you still look good, mashallah, protect you and uh, preserve you, inshallah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, tell us, how important is it to understand and appreciate and preserve our Islamic history? Of course, Islamic history is very, very important. And uh, we're tied to it anyway, because if you read Quran, if you read Hadith, you know, you're reading uh, history as, as you go along those surahs or uh, certain books of Hadith. And um, of course, you know, if you don't have any context, then a lot of it is meaningless. Um, but also, you know, especially uh, Muslims in Britain, we have to understand where we came from. Many of us, you know, we're not native to Britain. Um, so it's important to understand history, all history, not just Islamic history, um, so that, you know, we, we understand who we are, uh, you know, the, the cultures and traditions that we've inherited, uh, where we've come from, and also the history of our religion. You know, it's, it's incredibly important. I couldn't put it in words. Yeah, and preserving those elements of the history that we talked about is important. You look at Christianity, Judaism, you look at some of the other faiths, they've done that. Why is that not happening in recent years in Saudi Arabia? They're often accused of not preserving that history. What would you say? What does the evidence tell us? Yeah, so in terms of Saudi Arabia, there's a large misconception that uh, they haven't preserved many of the uh, sites of heritage. Um, but we have to take into consideration, you know, the entire Islamic history. I mean, many of the buildings, uh, you know, around the Kaaba, for example, and around the Masjid of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina, uh, many of those houses were actually taken down, you know, in the first hundred years, and then throughout the centuries to extend the mosque. Um, so, of course, we don't have many of these sites because uh, room needed to be made for the uh, increasing numbers of Muslims over the centuries. Uh, so that's one point. Uh, the second point is that there is some uh, effort in terms of uh, Saudi archaeology. Oh, sorry. The, in terms of Saudi archaeology and um, 
that has obviously helped in terms of building a picture of Islamic history, but th there's a lot more that could be definitely done. Because mm. there's an important museum in Medina Dol Manavira which preserves that history, recreates some of that history. Do you think the Saudis are changing their ways now on understanding how important it is to preserve history and reinvent the history, if you like, based on, on the scriptures? So uh, in Makkah, there was a museum called uh, Ya'a Yohan Nabi, which uh, sadly it closed down, and I think that was just before the pandemic. Um, and they were actually, you know, heading in that direction. Uh, this museum had artifacts from Islamic history. Some of these items were like uh, pots and uh, weapons, armor, that would have resembled the types of things that would have been uh, around at the time of the Prophet So that's one example. Um, but there's a lot more archaeology happening at the moment, uh, you know, in the deserts of Saudi Arabia, where they're uncovering uh, Saudi's long history. Uh, but of course, as I said, you know, a lot more could be done, especially with respect to the global ummah, you know, because we all have an interest in our Islamic heritage. And uh, it, it would just be great for more accessibility to these sites. Um, and, you know, th th there could be more historical tours and trips and things like this. Uh, they do happen, but uh, many of the ones I've seen have been in Arabic only. And of course, most Muslims don't speak Arabic. So uh, there's definitely room for improvement. Yeah, I mean, Saudi Arabia is on a journey. Lots of change going on. There's political conversations, which is for a different guest maybe. But when you look at their changes and what they're bringing in, in terms of the, the holiday visas that are now opening up and the archaeology yeah. that you talk about, that's a positive thing to take away from this. It's a positive thing, and I think it's still in its early stages. Um, of course, you know, and I have to reiterate, when you go to Medina, for example, you're not going to see many of the things that you will read about in the, in the Quran or in the books of Hadith and history, because over time, these things have changed. And, uh, you know, we all have to appreciate that. Um, and as long as we remember that, you know, there are still many, many historical sites and uh, places in Saudi Arabia, which, you know, if we wanted to learn more about Islamic history, we could. Yeah. C could you give us an example of that? Yeah. So, for example, when the Prophet ﷺ made Hijra from uh, Mecca to Medina, the route that he took, uh, you know, it's well known. It's recorded in the books of history. And uh, I mean, there's many books about it, um, especially in Arabic, where uh, for example, some scholars have visited the sites where he stopped and they've taken uh, pictures, they've provided, uh, you know, like a, um, a geographical location, a satellite location for that particular spot. So you could visit them if you wanted as a tourist, definitely. Uh, so that's one example. But of course, there's places scattered around Medina, uh, not, not far from the, from the masjid itself. And, uh, and the same goes for Makkah, of course. Yeah, and, and that sense, when you as an historian or as, you know, as a student of knowledge, look at that period of Islamic history, it, it, it's kind of changed. There's been different rulers, there's been different clans, if you like, have run Saudi Arabia and the Ummah, the Khilafah and all of that. What, what, yeah. what's, what thing stands out for you when it comes to understanding that Islamic history that we can apply to today's societies? Uh, so, I mean, this is the challenge, you see, because I remember going uh, on Umrah with my wife in around 2003, 2004. And at that time, I was expecting, uh, you know, like something to resemble what I've been reading about all this time. And when I got there, I saw, you know, all these extravagant buildings and marble floors and, uh, and uh, you know, these kind of umbrella shades in, in Medina and so on. And I, was, uh, I have to be honest, I was quite disappointed. The, the most, I mean, the most beautiful thing I saw at that time was uh, the graveyard of Baki because it's exactly as it was. Yeah. Uh, but that was very little, you know. So um, I, I guess we, we have to see how we can use, you know, the available means to, uh, to retell the history of uh, Islam, uh, you know, which is what my book is one attempt at doing. Um, and of course, we, we have to uh, study 
about our Islamic history, you know, not just in Saudi Arabia, but outside it as well, because there's fascinating stories and uh, we've got to make sure that we're the ones telling it. Yeah. And, and you talk about uh, even here in the UK, there's a fascinating story around uh, Abdullah Quilliam and, you know, the, the early generation of, of Muslims in this country, in the UK, who have yeah. contributed. And there's a rich history there that we sometimes don't reflect on. Because we kind of think our history started in the 60s when our forefathers came, but it goes back a lot farther than that, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, yeah. So, I mean, there's evidence of Muslims visiting Britain in the 15th, 16th century. Um, and, you know, the, the, the more significant Muslim community uh, centred around Liverpool and uh, Woking, you know, where the Woking Mosque is, and uh, that was in the 1890s onwards. Um, and, you know, these were the first uh, Muslim communities in Britain to kind of establish their own spaces. They, they started publishing books in English, which is partly what I'm uh, writing about in my thesis, uh, is about the development of Islamic literature in English. And, you know, it really started, uh, some of it started in Britain itself through the efforts of Abdullah Quilliam and uh, Khawaja, Deen, uh, Khawaja Kamal uh, You know, these, these were two very prolific uh, authors at the time. Um, and unfortunately, they were forgotten in the post-war period when, uh, you know, uh, there was mass Muslim migration after the after World War II, um, you know, many of their efforts were just, they, they were unknown. Uh, and it's only more recently that we're seeing through the efforts of certain scholars and uh, historians that uh, their stories are being told. Yeah, um, we, we've got a couple of minutes before the break, but if we can look at that, we look at Pickthall. Again, he did a fantastic English translation of the Quran. He was an Islamic scholar um, and he was noted for that. I, translation done in 1930 yeah um, and it's widely used amongst the english-speaking word as well it was yeah and uh you've got another example of yusuf ali because Pictal was in uh india at the time when he was compiling his translation uh you also have Ab abdullah yusuf ali who who did a translation around the same time and there were others as well uh in fact there was a there was a real push at the beginning of the century um 20th century that is uh, where you had Muslims beginning to translate texts, Islamic texts like the Quran, and this was this was the first time that they basically, uh, you know, put out their own uh, voice, because prior to that time, uh, the colonialists were translating texts. Uh, as you know, the you know one of the earliest translations of the Quran was by uh, a Christian from Britain, and he was using a French translation. Uh, but you know, in the in the uh, 19th century, 20th century, you had efforts by Muslims themselves taking the, the this huge task of translating texts into English. Yeah, I, I find I find Islamic history and particularly British Muslim history fascinating. Um, you refer to the Woking Mosque. Uh, you know, I absolutely love going there. Um, yeah. and going to the cemetery as well, seeing the, the soldiers who as well. But anyway, it's a fascinating discussion. We want to talk about your book, your illustrations book. You're not going to go anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. We're going to take a very quick break, uh, brothers and sisters. And when we come back, we'll talk about our important illustrations book. Join us on the other side of these very important messages. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa welcome back. We are back. Yes, we are indeed. We're live here on British Muslim TV, wherever you are. Hope you're having a good evening. Um, I'm Hamish Shafiq. This is Questions from our studios here in Wakefield. Now, we're going to take, uh, we're going to open the lines, take some of your calls on 01924 If you've got a question for Azhar um, on Islamic history or how we preserve it, uh, we'll get through some of them uh, in a second. But you can also get in touch with us on social media. Quite a few of you are responding on Facebook in the chat box. Um, we'll get through some of that as well. But first of all, Azar, I wanted to ask you, where did the idea come from? You did an illustration book. It's titled The Houses of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Where did the idea come to do this? And what was the significance of focusing on the houses of the Prophet Yeah, so um, as I said, when I first made Umrah, you know, I expected to see something from the uh, 
Prophet's heritage, and uh, I was disappointed. Um, and I remember walking past the, the grave and looking behind the green cage, and I just wondered, you know, what's behind there? I could see something, but I just didn't get it. Uh, so over the years, you know, when I returned uh, to Medina, you know, I just tried to look harder through those holes and uh, started to read about it as well, uh, just to try and, you know, figure out what exactly is it. And, you know, it just fascinated me. Um, so I made Umrah a few years back and I decided I would do something along these lines. And I just, I just didn't have the, um, you know, the design style in mind at the time. Um, and at the beginning of last year, uh, 2021, I, you know, found this uh, particular style of design, which I really thought would work well in telling the story of the houses of the Prophet uh, in Medina. And, and that's what got me started. Yeah. And what sort of things can people expect in this book? It, it's an illustration book. Is it geared towards children or is it something that anybody can do at any age? I know, so it is for a general audience, but I had young people in mind um, because I really want them to, you know, engage with Islamic history. Um, and what you'll get from the book is basically a description of what happened in uh, the time of the Prophet ﷺ when he arrived in Medina and, uh, you know, where he lived, how he lived, um, and the different houses that were built for uh, him and his wives. And then what happened when he passed away, uh, you know, over the centuries to the house of Aisha where he was buried. Um, and then it, it leads all the way till present so that it gives people a good idea of what they'll expect to see when they, uh, you know, go to Medina for themselves. Yeah, because yeah. I suppose if you're standing in front of the Jali Mubarak, you are seeing the Prophet starts uh, blessed resting place first, then as of the Abu Bakr Siddiq, Radhi Allah Ta'ala, Hazrat Umar Radhi Allah Ta'ala knew. Um, not many people know it's in that order. Some people think it's the other order. Um, how important is it to get that out? You know, because you talked about the, this being the room of, of, of uh, Hazrat Aisha, Umar Mu'minin. Yeah, so uh, when you walk past it, and I'm talking about from the men's side, of, of course, uh, when you walk past that area, um, you, you see these three big uh, kind of gold uh, circles. And the first one is the largest one, and that represents, it's, it's just a representation of where the Prophet وسلم, is buried. And then the next one is Abu Bakr's, and then the next one is Umar and Huma. Um, so that's, that's perfectly fine, but people should understand it's just a representation because of course, uh, nobody's really seen behind uh, the structure that, uh, you know, you can kind of see it when, when you walk past, but nobody's seen it for a few hundred years. Um, so the exact places where they're buried, it, it would be difficult to tell for anybody because not, not even the present government has gone inside those walls that were uh, first built, uh, you know, around the year 88 after Hijra. Yeah, because again, fascinating um, discussion we're having. If you've got a question for us, 01924-231083. Um, what, you, what you're suggesting is when you're standing in front of the Jali, uh, when you go in, look inside, there, there is a wall uh, that was set up and it's completely sealed, um, which was done to protect uh, the blessed resting place uh, as well. And, and that's really important as well. What yeah. did you learn about yourself as you were doing this book? About myself? Yeah. Um, partly that I didn't know, you know, uh, as much as I thought I did, <laughs> because, you know, every time you, you, you look into history and you read the debates surrounding certain things, um, that's one thing, you know, th there was many things which I, I discovered for the first time. Um, but it, it was quite a moving journey for me to write this book, because, of course, we're, you know, when you're concentrating on the houses of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, you can't help but, uh, you know, admire his simplicity and his beautiful nature. You know, I mean, this, this is the, the, the man who uh, was chosen by Allah and he, you know, spread Islam and, and now it reaches all four corners of the earth. But he lived in very simple dwellings. I mean, in terms of height, it was about two meters the width of the house was uh, roughly five meters and the length of the house was three and a half meters. 
it's a very small space and in terms of belongings you know he, he only had a few things a uh, bed and his clothes his weapons um they, they had a you know like utensils for cooking cleaning mm. uh, washing and so on um so you know th that was moving for me because it just reminded me of you know his beautiful life and an example for sure yeah and and the other thing which i i i was reading um that when the Prophet Islam passed away, uh, Hazrat Aisha uh, w stayed in the room. The room was split into two as such, and the Prophet Islam was buried there. Then when her yeah. father passed away, um, she continued to stay there. But when Hazrat yeah. Umar passed away, the second caliph, um, obviously um, she then put up a uh, barda, um, you know, between the two, and then later on obviously uh, moved off that space. How significant is it? Because, you know, you look at women's contribution, you look at Barda, you look at the fence, that this is, people would argue, the most uh, beloved place, blessed place in the world ever. Yeah, for sure. And, I mean, Aisha continued living in the house. Um, in the year uh, 11, the Prophet Sallallahu died. And then in the year 13, uh, her father, Abu Bakr, died and he wanted to be buried next to the Prophet Sallallahu um, so when they were buried there, she used to still live in the house, even though there were these two graves in the in the far end. Um, and she used to continue as normal. She wouldn't wear her veil because that was, uh, you know, her late husband and father. Um, and then she wanted to actually be buried alongside her her father and, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um, but of course, Umar he was uh, he was. He, he died in the year 23 and he before dying he requested could i be buried with my companions um and she agreed um when when that happened she then did set up a screen and basically she would have had about half of the house and uh, as i said before the length of the house was about three and a half meters so she had about half of that space to live in and she lived in 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 that uh you know smaller space for another 20 or, uh, sorry, about 30, 35 years after that. Um, and of course, she was a scholar, so her yeah. family would visit her. And many, many of the people at the time would visit her to learn hadith directly from her. You know, she, she's one of the most important scholars of Islam of all time. Uh, so the, the, there's, there's no way we, anyone could, you know, diminish her value. Yeah, in the sense that she had a front seat, if you like, at the heart um next to the Prophet ﷺ, um, and, and as you said, she was a muhaddis in her own right. Uh, many yeah, and, of the great Sahabis yeah. uh, learned Islam and hadith from her. Yeah, men and women. Mm. And, uh, you know, just to remind everyone that uh, the Prophet ﷺ died with his head on her lap. And during itikaf in Ramadan, uh, you know, he, he would be in the masjid, but he had a door from the house of Aisha, which led directly into the masjid. Um, so during itikaf, he, he would place his head at that doorway and she would comb his hair. Um, and that, that's the same door he actually stood at, uh, you know, the, the final time that the companions saw him, uh, you know, on the day that he died. Uh, so she had a very, very close relationship with him, as did the other wives, but no, no one as much as Aisha. You know, she, she saw so much more and that's why her hadiths have so much value in in terms of the private life of the prophet yeah um there is uh, also when you look at that is uh, the book that you wrote illustration book what how how we're coming towards the end of the program probably about three minutes left i just want to talk about what's the reaction been now that it's been published yeah well so far the reaction has been really positive and i've been really uh, pleased with it um it's got me thinking okay what else can i do now you know uh, um, i'm working on a book about the history of the kaaba um but you know if allah wills i would love to do more about the seerah of the prophet and, and give more uh kind of maps and images surrounding uh the history of uh the, the seerah you know including archaeology and uh, and the different uh, avenues that we could learn more about the seerah give it more life hopefully yeah, and make it relevant to people's lives now, because that's the yeah. uniqueness about the Prophet Islam is he is for his rahmat al alamin for all generations, all alamin, um, yeah. not just preserved for a one time, uh, uh, one generation. He's there until the end of time. 
That's right, yeah. And around the, the year 88, when the houses were demolished, the, the houses that belonged to him, um, you know, because they were at the time extending the mosque, uh, one of the people who was at the time a scholar, he, he said, I wish that they, they, they had kept that house so that people could have learned that, you know, the, 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 this basically the, the greatest prophet and so on. Uh, you know, the simplicity in which yeah. he lived. And that's the, I think, the biggest takeaway from the book and also from reading about his life, about his simplicity, his humbleness and his uh, devotion to Allah. Um, you know what? I could talk to you for hours, Azar. I find this absolutely fascinating. Um, thank you so much. How can people get hold of the book? Uh, yeah, so they can basically find it on the website, which is afadhouse.com, uh, A-double-F-A house.com and uh, you can search for it on amazon uh, it's available there yeah well thank you uh, so much uh, sir for joining us sadly we reached the end of our time together uh, i want to take this opportunity to say thank you i really found that fascinating discussion and, and best wishes and look forward to welcoming you back uh, when you do that book on the kaaba thank you so much as a majority the author and phd student uh, joining us live there from leicester now after the break we're going to head to melbourne in australia yes live to talk with the Iranian refugee who arrived when he was 15 and he's been in permanent detention for eight years. And a uh, fascinating discussion. And it's the same hotel in which Novak Djokovic was also held in detention when he arrived um, and his visa was rescinded. Lots to talk about uh, with brother Adnan. We'll take a very quick break. Don't miss this discussion. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamualaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. Uh, we want to just share some of the questions that have come in uh, for Azhar. Uh, and obviously one of them was, uh, was it easy to research for the book on the houses of Medina? Um, but yeah, there was a, I just wanted to get through some of these questions because I often ask you to comment and then I don't read them out. So uh, I'm, and I'm sorry we ran out of time with uh, beloved uh, Azhar. The other one was uh, Aisha Ali uh, on Facebook asking, preserving... Uh, Islamic history is so important as the schools in the UK don't teach that history about true Islam for our children. Um, and when they do teach what they have learned from books, they have been written by non-Muslims or people who do have very little knowledge about that history. And that's why that book um, by Azhar uh, called Houses of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, is available now and, and I'd encourage you to get involved in that. So we, we're going to be going to Australia very, very shortly to talk to Brother um, Adnan, um, who is um, a Iranian refugee and he was held, he's, he's been held, Novak, Novak Djokovic, who is the tennis player, um, the, the tennis player, um, who was who flew into Melbourne for the Australian Open, which starts next week. Um, he had a medical exemption uh, because he said he'd had COVID uh, in the middle of December, and therefore uh, that was the reason why he got an exemption. He arrived, the Australian, became a, it became a political battle, if you like. And Australian uh, government decided to rescind uh, his visa um, and put him in detention, in a detention hotel. And obviously, he's allowed then to appeal that decision. It was appealed. And on Monday, um, the judge ruled that the Australian government um, had not followed the rules correctly. And therefore, um, he, he gave the visa back. And Novak Djokovic was staying in the same hotel as many Afghan refugees um, are staying Afghans, Iranians, anybody's a refugee. Um, life is very tough for the refugees, and we wanted to talk to somebody about that real experience. Because obviously, Novak Djokovic, as a world sportsman, um, Serbian sportsman, um, has also been criticized in the last 24 hours. Because um, not only is he somebody who hasn't been vaccinated or hasn't confirmed that he has got the vaccination, um, and there's a real fear now that because he misrepresented questions on his visa form, um, he could face the possibility of deportation. 
from Australia. So this story, which we all thought was going to be finished on Monday, is still going on. Um, you could potentially um, have to face questions when he gets back to Serbia. So he's Serbian. He's broken isolation um, when he had COVID last month. And the Serbian prime minister has been talking today and she said, uh, has warned that his behaviour appears to be a clear breach of the rules. And there's a sense that he could get uh, fined. Um, and that's going to be a real big issue uh, for him. So he is chasing a historic 21st Grand Slam. Uh, it starts on Monday, the Australian Open in Melbourne. Um, but he could still be potentially... Um, deported by the Australian government, uh, which is still not happy about his medical exemption that he got because um, of the fact that he had had COVID. Now, Djokovic today has been saying um, that he acknowledged that he knew that he had tested positive when he allowed himself to go and have a newspaper interview and a photo shoot in the Serbian capital on the 18th of December. Remember, he tested positive on the 16th and therefore should have been in isolation, but he didn't. He said he's made an error of judgment. He also blamed human error uh, by his support team. So I'm going to have to keep a straight face with this one because he says, and I quote, for a mistake in his immigration paperwork, he said they failed to declare that he had travelled outside Serbia to Spain in the two-week period before entering Australia. So obviously it's a bit like uh, you have to declare where you are. So I don't know where we are in terms of our guests. We're still trying to get uh, connect with him um, whilst we're waiting uh, for him to join us. We'll carry on the conversation. 01924-231083. And also the other big story that's been in the news here in the United Kingdom has been Boris Johnson. Now, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been accused of not telling the truth around the issue of parties, drinks with work colleagues in Downing Street. And we uh, have seen that the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, just want to share this before we go to our next story, um, had apologised today in the House of Commons, uh, saying that he had indeed been to this party and he was very, very sorry. He still believes that he had followed the rules because the house, uh, that Downing Street is not just his home, it's also an office, it's where the central government, anyway, that's going to, roll on until we get the report from uh, Sue Gray, who is investigating uh, the parties. But yeah, a, a busy day there. Now, when tennis star Novak Djokovic was held in detention at the Park Hotel this week in Melbourne, as his visa was withdrawn, he joined a number of refugees who've been housed at this hotel for over a year. The hotel has been designated by the Australian federal government as an alternative place of detention, APOD, for refugees and asylum seekers. Now, Adnan Chupani was 15 when he fled Iran for his life, uh, for a life in Australia. And eight years later, he's still been held in detention. Now, Novak Djokovic has been released from that particular hotel. Adam and his fellow ref um, <coughs> excuse me, refugees are still waiting for their freedom. Pleased to say Adam Chupani is joining his life from uh, Melbourne in Australia. Uh, Salaam alaikum. Welcome to the program, sir. Great to have this conversation. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, what's your response to the media storm over the tennis player Novak Djokovic and his detention in the hotel you, you are being held in? Well, uh, if I want to put it uh, short and simple, it's, uh, it's a little bit unfair. Because? Be because uh, in the first place, uh, we both, uh, as a as a as a human being, we've been uh, locked up uh, more than uh, more than years and almost decade in uh, in uh, immigration uh, federal detentions, and we haven't seen uh, that much attention, and we haven't seen that much coverage than uh, Mr. Djokovic, uh, but uh, we still uh, are uh, thankful and lucky that uh, Mr. Djokovic been uh, highlight uh, that uh, situation. 
Yeah. Um, just for our viewers' sake, watching this around the world uh, tonight, uh, what do you, why did you choose to leave Iran and go to all that way to Australia? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, we, as an Arab minority, we are facing a very apartheid and uh, 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 occupation from uh, Iranian authority and uh, Iranian government. So we we thought and I thought that uh, I'm going to seek uh, protection in Australia and I'm going to be respected as a human being. But uh, unfortunately, I, I find it is so opposite to the reality and I've been locked up since then until now, which uh, I turned 24 and uh, we saw treated so racistly and so unfairly. Mm. And, and what was that journey like? So obviously your life is in danger in Iran. You are having to make that very tough decision, which is, do I stay here and get killed or do I leave and get a better life. You're 15, you choose to leave Iran and you head to Australia. What was it, what was it about Australia that you, that you liked or you read about and why did you choose that? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, on that time, I didn't really have uh, much background about, about it. And uh, my family made a decision for me to flip my home country and uh, find myself in a in a in a safer in a safer country, so I didn't uh, really make that decision. So my family did uh, choose this uh, decision for me, and uh, like I said, uh, we are uh, facing a really unfair, a brutal government, and but uh, we are facing. Uh, a same government in a in a professional uh, in a professional uh, ways and uh, abusing uh, humans uh, in a in a in a modern uh, in a modern ways. Now, how was your detention? So you arrive in Australia. You're only fifteen. What was it like being in detention in Australia? Well, uh, to be honest, if I want to talk about uh, about my own experience, if from day one, I've been uh, facing uh, uh, injustice and uh, rush, uh, terrifying uh, detention experience, which uh, when I was 15, they putting me so wrongly about uh, 11 months with the uh, adult facility. And from day one, I've been uh, experiencing uh, injustice uh, system and rush, uh, uh, rushly and harshly environment. And after 11 months, they'd been sending me to the minor facility and they were saying, well, it seems so simple. It was a, it was a mistake. Okay, um, I, I know you're going to stay there. Thank you so much. I know this conversation can be difficult at times because you're having to relive that experience, that trauma. So thank you so much, um, Adnan. Uh, there, stay there. We're going to take a very quick break. When we come back, uh, we'll continue the conversation and look about how life is like in this particular hotel that you're staying at. Uh, they're called the Park Hotel uh, in downtown uh, Melbourne. My special guest, uh, Adnan Ju uh, Barney joining us live uh, from Melbourne in Australia, where it's the morning there. Um, so we'll take a very quick break around uh, that. We'll talk a bit more about Novak Djokovic in the sense that not only did he test positive, he broke Serbian isolation rules um, and had gone to visit a newspaper and had a picture taken whilst being positive. We could question around that, isn't there? The rules are there to be followed, not to be broken. Anyway, we're carrying the conversation at the Nan. Let's take our final break. Join us on the other side of this. Asalaamu As Alaikum.
Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. My special guest is Adnan Chupani, uh, the refugee who's been held in detention for over eight years. He's still live with us uh, from Melbourne uh, in Australia, where the Australian Open is happening. Uh, Novak Djokovic uh, was in the same hotel uh, as they've been held in. Uh, we want to take your calls as well. So 01924231083. Now, Adam, you were, uh, sorry, uh, Adnan, brother, you were granted refugee status five years ago. Yeah, I don't understand. Why are you still in detention? Why are why the Australian government still got you in detention? Well, uh, like, uh, as we all know, Australia uh, exercised a very harsh, rough uh, uh, migration uh, policy against uh, maritime arrivals. And uh, as they always said, uh, they have uh, a strong border uh, policies and uh, they saving life uh, drawing on the sea and uh, unfortunately this is a uh, this is a uh, a very a very uh untrue uh a lie i will say it to buy more vote for for uh a camp uh, a campaign uh, elections and uh, we have uh, been a victim of this uh, policies. Uh, we've been determined as a refugee and we are guaranteed a refugee, but we still remain in detention. Australia have a much more longer uh, period of time in a war that keeps asylum seekers and detention in, uh, in immigration facilities. And it's been almost a decade we have been in detention. If I want to put it so simple, they just want to create example of us to the, to, the, to the region, to the whole world, that if you want to come to Australia, illegally by boat, like what they say, there is no way for you to settle in Australia, no matter even if you determine as a refugee. So we are a victim of uh, this uh, policy, of this, uh, of this treatment, and yeah. Okay, so um, we know that you're staying in this hotel. It's a hotel. You shared a video on social media which showed what the hotel is like. You can't leave the hotel. And the only sort of exercise you can get is to go onto the roof, but you cannot leave. You cannot open windows. It's like a like a prison, isn't it? It is. It is. It is. And um, like I said before, it's a it's a it's a modern uh, way to lock people in the twenty first century in the in the middle of the city. With uh, without any crime, without uh, any any uh, the the only the only crime uh, I think we did we asked Australia for help. Hmm. It was probably a choice. If you stayed in Iran, you would have got killed, and you obviously took that decision. Do you feel that the Australian government is dehumanizing you, as you've been described, just as a number? They describe you not. A as you, by your name, they describe you as a detainee, as if you're a prisoner. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, they design uh, they design a system to to break uh, to break people to these human uh, uh, people to send people back to where they come from. So. For example, uh, a very a simple uh, request that uh, that we do to for to get a, a medical uh, to see a nurse, we have to do a medical request. On top of the medical request, they putting a detainee request. At any request, they mention a detainee request, or they call us by our our boss number or detainee. 
So the whole idea, the whole uh, system designed to break, to break us, to break our spirit. Mm. And uh, it's really, I found it it's really unfair. Yeah, um, I think lots of people watching this will find that really unfair. Um, we have, um, we have a, a general election, a federal election in Australia this year. Um, have some of the opposition party, the opposition is Labour. Uh, have they been in touch? Are they campaigning for you? Have you reached out for support? What's the campaign like on the ground there? Well, uh, to be honest, like I said be, uh, before, we we victim of uh, two major uh, party, which is Labour and uh, Liberal. Uh, as uh, as we all know. The, the Pacific solution made by John Howard on uh, on 2000. He was, and, the, uh, uh, he, he was a former Australian prime minister who brought in this uh, new draconian policy that if you travel to Australia in a boat, you would be held in detention um, off uh, the coast of uh, Australia in a third country. Yeah, and uh, it's been uh, made by John Howard's and after that, it's been uh, followed by Labour, and uh, we we are uh, victim of a uh, two major party. And on 2013, uh, the policy made by uh, by uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, which was the uh, the uh, the MP of the of Australia, and. Uh, it's been uh, continued by uh, liberal later on, and it's keep going. Yeah, because um, asylum seekers and refugees are easy to bash than stand up for. It got so bad, uh, Adnan, that you even regret coming to Australia, and you would rather go back to Iran, where if you did go back, you could be you could be killed. Ex ex exactly. If uh, if I know if I gonna gonna go back and I'm just facing a very certain uh, death without any torture I definitely would but uh, I'm gonna face torture and I'm gonna face death but here and in, uh, in Australia immigration detention I'm facing uh, mostly mental torture and keeping keeping me in limbo and in different detention what do you want to happen now well uh, i really i really wish that uh, australia take a big responsibility and uh, show other countries and show us they they do respect human uh, human uh, rights and let uh, other country help us new zealand uh, our uh, new zealand government are happy to give us a home but unfortunately australia keep denying it keep refusing the offer so i really want to see they they take responsibility and let other country help us or they could resettle us as soon as possible. Yeah, it's really tough. Um, we did ask uh, the Australian Home Affairs Department, which is responsible for immigration and citizenship, uh, about your case, and we asked them for a statement. Uh, nobody was available to come on, um, and, uh, and even then we've not had a response back to our questions, so we'll keep pursuing that. Um, the world is watching you, sir not just here on British Muslim TV, but on other networks as well. What message do you want to say to the world and what can we do around the world to help highlight your case and help you get you out of detention? Well, uh, it's time uh, to, in the first place, uh, please do not copy this uh, type of uh, policy because it's really inhuman and cruel and uh, in uh, in uh, injustice. 
And uh, secondly, it please put a pressure on Australia government to resettle us as soon as possible and shut down offshore processing center. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. what we're going to do, thank you so much, uh, Adana. What we're going to do, we're going to keep an eye on this story. We're going to continue to contact the Department of Home Affairs and we'll even contact the Australian High Commissioner based here in London uh, and demand some answers uh, for you uh, on your behalf and, and the questions that we're trying to get uh, answered as a broadcaster. But thank you so much, sir. Uh, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you your freedom so that you can start your new life and we wish you and your fellow refugees in your hotel uh, the very best. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you guys. Pray for us. Inshallah. Uh, that was Adam uh, Chirpani. The Awazi community is a minority uh, of Sunni community in Iran. Um, the, the allegations are that they've been oppressed, uh, they've been tortured and they've been killed. Um, it's obviously an allegation which that community uh, have made for a number of years. It's something which the Iranian government would disagree with, um, obviously. Uh, but as I said, we did try to get in touch with the Australian Department of Home Affairs. Nobody was available to come on. Nobody wanted to respond to our questions. And also, um, as I promised, we'll reach out to the Australian High Commission as well. But imagine that. Imagine being 15 years old and eight years later, you're still held in detention as a refugee, even though you've got refugee status. And it was in the same hotel where Novak Djokovic was held. And Novak Djokovic, being a world sportsman, celebrity, uh, was able to use his uh, money and influence to challenge that decision and he was out of court within a few days uh, out of that hotel within a few days and adam and his colleagues uh, still have to wait there thank you so much uh, to him he was joining us live there uh, on british muslim tv from melbourne in australia now we've reached the end of the program firstly i want to thank our special guest tonight shiki lafsa as a uh, majority and adnan chupani there from melbourne in australia we're back on the screen again next wednesday at the same time of 8.30. Uh, I want to say thank you to the team behind the scenes here in the studios in Wakefield. From me, Mohammed Shafiq and the whole team, thank you so much for joining us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Take care of yourself and each other and I'll see you next week at the same time of 8.30. Allah Hafiz. Have a great week. Assalamu alaikum.